All right, should work. Can someone see if they can? Yes. Um, can you check if the live stream is on? Thomas? Ah. Hmm? Thomas, check. Yes, we should be live. Yeah? yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Can. Huh? You can hear? Yeah. All right. Yes. All right. All right. This is where we start. Um, all right. You guys probably don't need your computers for now. So put those away. Thomas. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're going to start a new workshop ses session uh, preparing for SWE interviews. If anyone, um, so this is basically for anyone who wants to build like intuition on how to solve lead code problems, but I'm not going to teach it in that specific way. It's more think of as competitive programming um, in the sense that I want to build intuition rather than just burning through a bunch of lead code problems. So when the time comes, um, you can potentially come up with your own solutions um, to difficult problems and go beyond lead code. Because um, if you're going to do some high level work, uh, you probably need more information, more algorithmic knowledge than what is provided in lead code. For example, there's a great book. Um, called <clears throat> Competitive Coding. Um, it's by Stephen Halem um, that you can read through. Um, it's really useful. And it helps you get into competitive programming. Maybe you can do competitions like ICPC, IOI, um, or USACO. Uh, so the goals of these lessons are basically going to be building such an intuition that just by coming to these lectures and doing the practices provided here, you should be able to get through any interview possible. Uh, we have some specialists in the room that have cracked um, interviews by themselves. Um, Abhimanyu and uh, some of the other people who are going to help teach this have cracked interviews themselves. So hopefully you can learn from them and we can get through it. All right, we'll, we'll cover the most basic things today just so we can go over the bare minimum you need to start solving problems and then we'll give you a bunch of problems so you guys can go right ahead and start doing them on your own. So the first thing Come we're going to cover is time complexity. Now why is this important? Like a lot of times like the fundamental like details of implementing code are kind of abstracted away from you because you're working with libraries a lot of the work is already done for you. But like I guess like when you move up, uh, like more than just the correctness of the code, the efficiency becomes really important. Uh, so does readability. And therefore, we're not just going to teach you how to approach problems, but also do so in a manner that's understandable and intuitive. But um, as for efficiency, like one of the most common ways of just seeing how well an algorithm does a task is time complexity. and. Uh, so like the notion of time complexity uh, came up because uh, if you just make a program run on a computer and you see like the number of seconds that have elapsed, that's not particularly a fair test because the hardware can change. You can have different implementations. Um, so what we normally want to see is how a program behaves when you scale up the input arbitrarily um, to an arbitrarily large degree. Uh, so that it approaches theoretically infinity and how the program responds to that. So we have a number of examples over here. The first uh, box that you see is basically just straight line code. You have a bunch of uh, assignment statements one after the other. Um, think of each statement, each of these statements is just doing a very basic operation. Uh, and when you have a statement like this, like A is equal to five, it's taking a constant amount of time. And even if you have like, them stack one after the other, they're still constant because uh, they're finite and uh, you just have a limited number of them. If you have, like, say, even 
infinite number of inputs like uh, to this function, like the fundamental behavior would stay the same. They're just four assignment statements as you see over here. But if you move on to loops, things can become a bit more interesting because it's not static like this. The loop will behave differently depending on what inputs you pass it. So um, that that over there is uh, performing an uh, operation n plus a certain number of times. Um, and uh, what how I would initially approach it is seeing, okay, if I have zero inputs, uh, it runs a certain number of times. Uh, if I have one input, it just uh, does one plus whatever the number that is there, and so on. Uh, but uh, as the inputs get bigger and bigger, the significance of the second term next to n, it becomes smaller, because that's fundamentally the same for all of them. It's a very big number, but as you approach infinity, as I said earlier, it's relevance becomes less. And this actually, this entire loop statement is what we call O of n in big O. Um, no, it's actually like, that's an upper bound, like if you look at like it technically, but uh, what you basically have to understand is that if you have like, uh, say n, uh, a number of inputs and they increase, the function will go, uh, scale up with that linearly. Um, here you have a for loop within a for loop. Think of uh, whatever's inside the for loop is just doing like a constant amount of work, similar to these four assignment statements stacked one after the other. If you do that constant amount of work n times, it's O of n. But we have a, a, another loop out of it over here. So you're doing an operation that scales linearly with your inputs n times again. So that's O of n square. Again, uh, o, when you say O of n square, Normally, uh, big O is thrown around, but uh, O is actually an upper bound. O of n square over here would actually be the tight bound for this. Um, and uh, finally, you can look at the code. Does anyone there. want to guess what the complexity of that is? Which one? The last one, all the way at the right. Sure, I mean, it depends on the image. Exactly, yeah. So there are two constants. So how would you describe it? Um, yeah? O of n squared. Top loop and then O of M to the bottom. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So O of N square plus M. And what all of you like identified correctly is that the particular input matters because both of them could be growing in different scales. And therefore you can't just say O oh, because that grows like <coughs> quadratically, it will dominate because you don't have any information about N and N uh, from before, except that they can grow in an arbitrarily large manner. You don't know the details of that growth specifically. So yeah, if you have like Two, two variables are an arbitrary number of variables. You have to like include all of them in your big O notation. Yeah, exactly. So that's another good point. But we can't ignore it on the one on the right because yeah, course, yeah. they're different variables. But thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. All right. Um... Uh, so this is the important part, and this is where we get into some of the competitions that really matter. For example, um, all competitions have strict bounds, and they're always set. These don't really change. What does change is how what our n is. So on top of every problem sheet, there will be an n written. And through that, you can look at these possible complexities to say, OK, um, based on that, the max the upper bound of my program is probably only going to be O of n squared or things of that nature. So for example, if your n is 7,500, um, you want to hit an o of n, o of n squared notation for it to be in that time limit. Does this make sense? Does everyone understand what this chart is? Yes? Um, all right, we're going to run through basic data structures so we can get through problems as quickly as possible. Um, in this course, we're not really going to go over actual code because everyone can write code. Um, but more, again, I want to emphasize more intuition, more problem solving skills is what matters when it comes to competitive coding and solving interviews. So whatever you use is irrelevant as long as you know they exist, but make sure you understand how exactly you need to think in order to problem solve all of these problems. So first, um, 
you should know what an array and dynamic array is. Does anyone here not know what an array or dynamic array is? Uh, London, can you tell me what the difference between the two is? Yeah, a static array um, is not resizable. Perfect. Array yeah, so one thing to note is uh, what their O of N are. So sometimes, um, this is the main part when you're looking at why data structures matter and why like the classes are called data structures and algorithms because each data structure has a different O of N. For example, uh, like O of N, it, the only thing like it is very important about is that you can index it at O of one time. If you write like what is like this list, zeroth index, you can get it in O of one time. All right. Um, and for dynamic array, there's different things, but adding and removing is O of n time. So for example, if you have, uh, looking at this again, if you have something 10 to the 12, 10 to the 18, you can't necessarily add or remove from an array. So you need to either make something of your own, uh, come up with a new way of solving problems, or um, Find a way to reduce and n, I guess. Just to clarify, when you say add over, you mean like insert in the middle of an array, right? Yeah. Yeah. And or at any index. Yeah, yeah. Even at the end. So, and the intuition behind that is that if you want to add like an element at a particular spot, like the elements that would come after it, like in the final uh, stage, would basically have to be shifted to the right, and therefore, like that, could, and that the number of elements could be proportional to the size of the entire array. That's why it's a linear operation. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, this we're not going to go too much into like how these can be implemented because we're focusing mainly on intuitions. But whereas an array, you can only access an element uh, through the index, like which actually starts from zero. A map is basically a set of, of pairs. It's actually a, a slightly uh, more specific or stronger implementation of a set. Because you both have you have a key and a value. It's very similar to a dictionary. In fact, in Python, it's literally uh, called a dictionary. Uh, the operations over here, actually, this is a bit of a lie because it depends on whether it's a tree map or a hash map. But assume in the worst case, they're log of n, like uh, because they're kind of organized in a tree, and at each stage in the tree, you're kind of dividing the elements. You're multiplying them by two. So the height of the tree is. Uh, it scales logarithmically with the number of inputs. But uh, yeah, just forget about that for now. Like basically what you need to know is that you have very efficient axes, uh, accesses like with a <coughs> map because uh, you can just specify a particular key and get the value corresponding to that. It's um, in fact an array, you can kind of think of it as uh, again, a more specific version of a map because the keys over here are basically just the indices. Um, as, whereas in a map, you can have any a uh, hashable object, for example, if you're using a hash map. All right. Who's ready for some problems? Um, can everyone see this problem? Yes or no? All right. We will, we will make do. Um, Abhi, when you want to read the problem? <laughs> uh, does anyone want to come up and read the problem? Maybe? No, just read it. Okay. Okay. So um, to pass time, Bessie the cow and her friends uh, likes to play a version of a game they saw at a county fair. To start, Bessie puts three inverted shells on a table and places a small round pebble under one of them. She hopes it is a pebble. Oh, she, okay, that's irrelevant stuff, basically. Bessie then proceeds to swap pairs of shells, uh, and her friend uh, tries to guess the location of the pebble. Like It's a, a pretty like simple game. Like A lot of you would have just seen it at a fair way. You have like a random object placed under three cups. And one yeah. person just randomly like swaps it multiple times. The other has to guess which one, um, it, it, the which cup the pebble is under at the end. Uh, not too complicated. Yeah. This is not too complicated. Where does it say this? On the left, right there. It says low order. I think it's the order of the hard one. This is low order. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the cows Everyone like. Gets it, right? Like there's a pebble under one of the cups. Yeah. So she guesses in between every swap. Yeah. Yes. She guess right no. uh, she, yeah. Basically. She just. Yeah. Freely. You want to find out where. Uh, it's not a very game. interesting game. The main idea is just like you having to simulate it, basically, to get the. 
Um, so it's what you actually need to guess is like where the pebble needs to initially be placed. So that given her guesses, she gets the highest score at the end. Oh, okay. So, that's yeah. So, everyone got the question? Yeah. So, like, you can have the pebble at the second place, you can have the pebble at the first place, and you can have the pebble at the third place. Right. So, you're following the pebble through, and then you calculate yeah. the score should be. Yeah. End. But you uh, you are calculating the maximum score. Can you scroll down? Three yeah. starting positions. I'll just scroll down. Based on the way she got. Right. So, look at the input. So, basically, this is N. This is how many times she swaps happen, she guesses. Um, the first two are basically what swap. So originally, um, this is an example, but originally if it was like this, after this happened, it would be something like this. Make sense? Sorry, the input format. And she guesses one. The uh, input, this is just the number of swaps. So you can see there are three lines and they correspond to this number over here. Uh, each of these basically corresponds to the cup. Yeah. Uh, this, the first two, uh, basically is the swap. So over here she's swapping cup one and cup two. Okay. And then she and the third one is the guess exactly. Right. The position. So, so they can only swap the cup once. Yeah. On. Exactly. So Her you can swap. First, yeah. yeah. So you can only have a pair. Use. You can only have like a pair basically. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sense, but... So if the original was here. She would not get a point, but if the original was here, she would get a point. You want to find out where the original could be to maximize Elsie's uh, score. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. are we going to solve it like for fun? Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you guys two minutes. Come up with a solution. What? Um, okay, just come up with like a broad like idea of how you do it. To start, right? You can just step through. Like obviously, it's like well, I know for the sake of it, it's not efficient yet, but we can just start. <laughs> I guess, like for now, just like forget about efficiency slightly. I know, but, but yeah. it's an iterative process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So, so, so you step through, right? You, you basically would calculate based on the three starting potential positions, like follow swaps. You calculate the scores for each, right? That's kind of the worst. Sure, but how would you do that? Okay. So this is three the starting position or not? Yeah. So three, let's three say you take an input and is the first input. Got it. Okay. Sorry, but. The sample input that one doesn't make any sense because I thought uh, this we don't get, I thought we don't get the. Uh, are you are you referring to this number yes, here? I am, so yeah. that's basically just the number of swaps. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and Sorry, that, yeah. that can range from zero to hundred. You know, it's sure. bounded. So okay. to answer your questions, even if it like scales linearly, right? Yeah. You know, it won't be super inefficient because it's like capped at hundred. Right, right, of course. Yeah. I mean, sure. So okay, so so for here, like you would start by. Getting N. N is three. N is the first input, right? So okay, sure. You so get N. We're then gonna loop over it, like you know, each time. And again, this is kind of like just the most your brute force is, right? Yeah. And okay. then, so uh, I guess she doesn't. They swap it before she guesses, right? So she can't just start blind, right? So you do the first swap, right? And you have in memory you're tracking all three of them, right? Yes. Yeah. So and what would you be tracking? Like what is the position, right? So so I guess it could be. Zero, one, or three, right? So you can have position, um, and then you could have. Uh, so, like an array? No, it would be an integer. Right? Okay, so, so you get three integers, so let's say A, B, C. No, no, just, I just need one so far, right? Okay. So, one would just be position, you track it, right? And as we step over the swaps, right, we can just, like, line by line, you can then set the. Can I just stop you there for just like a second? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so sorry, over here, I, don't, I don't mean to take over. I, no, 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 no. I just want to be, so you want to like, uh, like iterate over this, right? Like right. from zero to three, right? So just like your thought process is completely fine. Just the thing is we only get this input once. We're not storing this string. We want to like basically read it as it's coming in. Right? Sure. So yes. you can't, uh, like basically in the solution, like uh, it's, but they're not exactly expecting you to like loop through it once. Loop to it through it three times. Yeah, yeah. I'm, to... I, I, we, we will. So, yeah. so sorry. Like, Keep going. Yeah. Um, but we're going to track the, like, hmm. okay, fair. So we can only we can only have the access to it once. Right? Yes. Yeah. So this, this comes from one right. Then we need three, right? Then we need three, three variables, kind of. No, do we? So, because, like, all that matters is we have the deltas, right? Okay. So if one and two swap, okay. but it wasn't in one or two, or sorry, if it wasn't in one, like if it was started in three, then it doesn't move, right? 
So yeah. then we can kind of ignore the actual moving part, and then we could basically base it on like the score. She guessed one, but it wasn't in order to like write that off, right? That would be a way to like, write that reduce. off as if. I mean, like the the swap doesn't matter. Yo, what sorry. you're trying to do is make each swap matter. But when they don't, they don't, right? So the way you got the sample output too, right? Sure. You basically have three cases, right? Okay. You can think of the first case as being, uh, I guess I'm going to kind of okay. go over the solution. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, you can think of there being three cases, all right? Um, the three cases are either you start off with the first one having the pebble, the second one having the pebble, make sense? And the third one having the pebble. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Make sense? So to start off with, you start off with three arrays. All right? This is how I would approach the problem. Um, of course, there's a lot of solutions. All right? You have these three arrays. And what you're trying to do is, in each loop, so the loop would go three times, n times, whatever. In each loop, you would manually perform this swap, meaning index one and zero would just change. All right, so after the first loop, this would look something like zero, one, zero. Make sense? Does everyone get how I got that? Sure. Yeah. This would look something like one, zero, zero. And this would look like zero, zero, one. Right. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. So we go through that. And what we do is we basically try to calculate, OK, once it moved from this to this, and Bessie or Elsie guessed one, so here the score would be zero. Right. Here the score would be one. And here the score would be zero. Sure. Does everyone get that? Yes. Yes? Yeah. So you follow through this process, and you have three of these, and you basically try to figure out which one of these maxes out after you go through this and dice Okay, cool. Question. Makes sense? Yeah, that's yeah, no, okay. So we solved it, right? Like that's kind of the proof. That's one solution. Sure. Um, so anyway, like your idea was basically to simulate the entire game. Kind of. I wouldn't use any erasers, right? So I would, How would, you do? I would have three integer variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a loop, you have A, B, C. Right, and so okay. then I would track the position, right? So I would over each um, A, B, and C, right? So for one here, we know that the position in, is one, two, or three, right? Okay. Okay. So let's make a position variable. Right. So there would be technically three of them, but there are three integers versus an array. It's on the okay. Side, right? So position one, position two, position three. Obviously, it, it this would scale as you scale the amount of cups, right? It, that's describing. So we could start by, you know, saying one, two, or three. Or if you want to do zero, one, two, like if you want to index it, like it, however you want to. Yeah. Sure. Up to, up to the okay. person, right? So if you have zero, one, uh, zero, one, one, two, three, that's the variables, right? You can then step through, right? And you could then calculate, all right, we swap one and two, right? Okay. So if it starts, at, let's start with three, for example. If it's three, if it's not one or two, mm -hmm. then leave no, right? And then, and then, you can do that for each of the variables. By basically calculating the swaps, you don't okay. need an array, right? You just need one variable, right? So you just cut your, your memory consumption by like three, and then you have a, a tracking score point for each of them. So you technically have six variables, six integers okay. versus the array, right? Yes. And so then you can then track the score based on the one she guesses based on those position variables, step through and increment the score base, and then you take which one has the highest score at the end. Output it. It would be kind of hard coded in that matter in the sense that you. Yes. Know. Right. Makes sense. Does everyone understand his implementation? Yes? Any questions? Yeah. Did the person just get one yes the whole time? Or were, was the example just one, one, one? Well, this is. Yeah, this is, is guess it for, could be like one, two, or yeah. 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 All right. Again. Yes. And I guess if you wanted to further like improve, right? Uh, Technically speaking, uh, you could, if you know she gets a point, you know, like you still have to track the thing, but you could cut out the computation for 
is this like you could naively get it for the other three. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. if you find like on the first try, you're still in section one. You can just break the loop then, yeah. right? Yeah. You can then you can. I don't know if that would be log recognition. I'm really bad at the log calculations, but you can basically cut out two of the still computations. Still I mean, in fact, but the constant time right. would be reduced, like the constant yeah. factor. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, best case scenario. Yeah. Right. Any other question? But the average case would improve. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Questions? Do you get the point of this? Um, the point of this problem is to identify that when you look at a problem like this, um, basically, when you look at all problems, you're trying to put them in buckets, right? What, what would I use for a problem like this? Um, so the first thing I do when I look at a problem like this, I'd look at n and be like, OK, I can use whatever the hell I want, because it's 100. Um, it, it's irrelevant. And secondly, um, the simplest thing I can see in solving this is you basically have to simulate it. Now, of course, there are some problems where you can find a very clever math solution, where you can find a formula with this and this number um, to come up with a solution in both constant time. But in something that has, if you scroll up, if something that has this much game, basically explanation into it, it's pretty obvious that it's a simulation. And when you think of simulation, you want to think of what is the most efficient data structure, you can store this in. That solution works too, but for those that are just learning for the first time, they're probably not going to come up with a solution like that. This kind of solution probably makes a little bit more sense. I guess, yeah. you, I guess you could also use big manipulation. You can have an integer or thing. I mean, like, like, like what he's saying, right? Like yeah. If there's, a, there's levels to it, right? You yeah. Solve this exactly. Problem, obviously. Uh, but, like, the basic thing is over here. Like, they give you details and that kind of nudges you in the direction of simulating the interval. Everyone get the point? Yes? Yeah. For the simulation problems, is it mostly like a memory efficiency thing that you want to? Um, or is it also time efficient? Or is, like, it, you know, we're doing kind of the brute force thing here because yes. it's n less than or equal to 100. Yeah. It was a simulation problem, but it was n, you know, greater than 10 to the 23. Yeah. Then how efficiency is also a consideration. So efficiency should always be a consideration. This is just the first problem that a lot of us have seen for competitive programming. I wanted to make it as simple as possible. But um, for most times, when you're thinking of simulation, the best way to do simulation is to always cut out the things that should not matter. For example, I'm not saying that's right, but in a if this were a little bit more complicated, um, I've seen variations of this problem where after a while, like this is the first one, only one that scores, after a while, these two become irrelevant. So you only keep track of this. Now imagine if instead of three, there were like a lot more. So you like, for example, it's like a tree. You can just prune the trees to only consider the things that matter to you. The point is, when you're simulating, you're trying to find the best and most efficient way to simulate it possible. Um, but for this, it's so straightforward that you can't really make it more simple, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've never done competitive programming, but yeah. is it all based on time complexity, or does yes. memory complexity and like other efficiencies, do, those, do they care about those? They care about those, but for like early levels, it's hard and even in like hard like as you get better at it they put it in between because most people don't care about of like memory complexity so they just put it in between to see if you know how to do them not as valuable but still useful um i'm gonna go over the second problem do you want to read it out <laughs> <laughs> i think it's problem four right? um how many problems do you guys want to do two or Three or four. Uh, okay, let's do two and see if we have, huh? They are all about the cow. We we love the cow. All right, uh, let's try this one. Yes. Uh, okay, so Farmer John has three cows. B E M. Um, they all produce seven gallons of milk. All right. Um, the milk output is potentially changing over time and Farmer John takes periodic measure to check over 100 days um, basically what happens. So he takes something like 35 Bessie minus 2, uh, meaning on day 35, the cow Bessie 
had two gallons lower than when it was last measured. Make sense? Um, essentially, you're trying to find out. Um, essentially, uh, each cow, whenever they have the highest milk production, um, in a sense, they have their photo framed on the wall. You're trying to find out how many times does the actual um, farmer John have to change that uh, picture. Because for example, if Bessie's a god and she keeps producing more and more milk than everyone else, uh, farmer John never has to change it. Make sense? Question makes sense? Let's look at a uh, sample input to better understand it. So um, here, if you look at this, Problem worse when it's um, if you look at this, you have uh, N4. Uh, on the seventh day, Mildred has plus three. All right. Um, here we can just we can just read this to kind of better understand um, how the sample input works. I got it. Okay, so so he's. We don't have data for every day, right? Yeah, no. Right. But we have we have like data every time it changes, right? Yes. Okay. So like, there's no gaps. No gaps. So and the only important thing is that it's unsorted. Right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, would you want to start out by just sorting this chronologically, or would that be pretty expensive? Well, what's the M M limit on this? Yeah, that's actually it's only it says uh, it's uh, a so each cow's mouth output probably sorted like taking the lead just have three like integers in the red. Okay. The number of times like one of them becomes the big max. Yup, and they're just like one. Uh, so N is between zero and hundred. You kind of flashed it in front of you, but over here, like if you have a tie, right? Like if the max score doesn't change, but like another cow gets the same as that max score, uh, as opposed to just one having that, then the scoreboard also gets updated, basically. So you're not only like concerned about like what the max score is, but uh, the number of cows that have that score. So if there's Bessie and whatever Ellie's, right? And Bessie has nine originally, right? She has the highest score. Then Elise, who was originally at seven, gets nine too. The scoreboard changes because now both of them have nine. And Does it change or she can go higher? She would have to go to ten, right? Uh, no, the scoreboard, the, both of them, uh, so only Elise's score changes from seven to nine. So you update it kind of one. You got Sorry. one more per week since it's higher. Yeah, um, well, it, 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 yeah. how do you break a tie? How do you break it? Uh, both, so both of them basically go on the scoreboard then. So, so it's considered a change, the plus one. Yeah, it's exactly. The important thing is that it's considered a change. Right. Does everyone get the problem? Problem understood by everyone? Question? Uh, kind of. Since you, since you kind of need like all the information from all the cows, is the solution just brute forcing by simulating everything? So all of these problems, hint, all of these problems are simulation problems. So you do need to simulate, but there is a more efficient way of doing this than just brute force simulation, if that makes sense. All right, so like would the brute force simulation be like 300 on the raise up? Uh, not necessarily. Okay, so you're saying three arrays right. with this. With like the daily entry, and then you have like an algorithm comparing the three entries. Okay, but the entries, there are only four entries. Make sense? Like the max would be 100, mm -hmm. yes. But there are only four entries, I guess. So that's only to day four then, right? Like zero, one, two, three. Yeah, because there are four, four days. Right? So I mean like, okay, we well, could get away with like an O of N pass, right? Like, yes. Over, over, regardless of the um, You could go slightly higher, so hint. Fair, 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 right? <laughs> So it's one to a hundred. How far can you go? Uh, yes. Deep. Pretty high. Right? But if you want to win, you should choose the four. 
it doesn't matter. So <laughs> it, it either works or it doesn't work. So if it right? runs within a specific amount of time, whoever submits it first will win, right? Uh, it doesn't matter how fast you do it. it let's try to solve this problem. Um, Everyone understands the question? Yeah, do you have a question? No, I'm gonna propose a solution. So I didn't know. So like first you probably want to sort it because you want to know the order in which things happen. And that would be any more day, I believe. Yeah. Uh, okay. so you sort your order inputs to yeah. day by day. And then uh, what I would do at first is have three variables uh, count to the number of uh, the amount of milk each cow produces on, on that day. And that'd be like E and B for how you move the uh, Each day you just add or subtract the amount from the cow that is recorded. And then uh, after you do that, you see, you, you like compare the three values, see which value is the highest or if there's a tie for the highest. And then you see if that changes from the previous day. And then you just keep doing that. Seems like a tracking variable. Yeah, all three tracking variables, kind of, because you want one for each cow. So what's the right, complexity? Like, you, need a, you need a way to track which one's the winner, right? And the last value. Yeah, yeah. And that would be, I guess that would really be another variable that you track to see um, which which set of cows is the winner. Um, complexity would be, I, I think it's just n log n, mm -hmm. because the sorting is n log n, and you iterate through the entire uh, response, which is n. Yeah. So it will index down to n log n. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so you're just tracking the number of days, right? Not the number of days before. Right? Like it's weeks. So, yeah. yeah. So um, I'd, uh, I think that you've covered the broad idea. That the main thing over here is that it's unordered. Yeah. And you want to fix that first because this is basically garbage to us. Yeah, yeah. We want to go like one day after another mm -hmm. and update the amount of milk that each of these cows produces. Yeah. Um, but instead of uh, like having variables, I would personally use a dictionary. Again, like, the uh, implementation doesn't matter that much at this stage because it's like the first session and we want you to start thinking more intuitively about these problems. I personally use a dictionary because like, we get it in a string format. So um, if you have this, you could immediately key into the dictionary and that would give you the amount of milk that that particular car has. And after each day, right, because that corresponds to a change, I would update the amount of milk that this particular car has. For example, Mildred. And then I'd loop through... Um, the uh, values of that dictionary once. This is a very inexpensive operation if you look at it because there are only three curves, right? And I'd calculate the max. Then I'd run through another loop. And this time I'd compare the amount of uh, milk that each cow has to that max, right? And if a cow has a value that's exactly equal to that, I'd append it to an array, okay? This is a temporary array because it actually changes with each iteration of the loop. The array represents a score one because as I said earlier, there can be multiple cows with the maximum score, and uh, all of them would go on the scoreboard. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you use an array, you could just have a counter, right? Because it, like, you don't actually care about output of this uh, Well, actually, if you go up, can you just. Uh, so over here, he puts pictures of the three cows, right? Okay. Uh, so, like, imagine if there are two cows. Uh, and, but like they're different cows, right? The counter would be, okay. but I guess you are right because there's only one cow would change. Right. So like you could iterate over your dictionary, right? Yeah. And then have kind of the last high score value, right? Mm -hmm. And then you could kind of do a fold operation or like look, and if it's equal to the last high, then it's a change. If it's greater than, it's a change. And you have to update the value. That's less than you go to the operation, right? And then that way, yeah, sorry. I hate memory with it, like inefficiency. Yeah. It's like my entire job. So I'm going to come at it from a completely different angle. So, oh, so Boris, like, is there like a thing where, you know, like uh, where you change it and, uh, you know, like the names are different, but like the value is the same on the score? If the names are different, then yeah. it's a change. Yeah, but, yeah. but if it's a change at all, it's a change, right? Yeah. But uh, like say, if they're just like two cows, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, like uh, Brenda and Elise, for example, and you have Matilda and Elise, right? The counter would get two for both of them, but like it's a different one. scoreboard, right? The counter would just be one because Elise stayed the same. Uh, so, no, so like in one, uh, I guess. Okay, so I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So yeah, but the counter to that would be that only one cow could change at a time. 
So the counter okay, would be different after each iteration. So you can have a, a flag, a true false. Right. But, 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 but you're right. Then, then that is like, is that better than a, a red, right? So fair enough. You could also have a you know, zero and like, so you're right, you could store it as a Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. different approaches, right? Yeah. yeah, but like in, actually there is no defense for this because like an array is objectively more inefficient, but you could argue that it's like a very small array with sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But you're right, you could use like a counter. Right, but it would never be open in the end, so you could allocate it. Right? Yeah. So, but then again, like the whole thing with these is the requirements change, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not for your competitive programming, but if you're you know, working on this in a corporate situation, like so you know, someone's gonna be like, oh, I wanna know what this cow is more, and then, then you're screwed. <laughs> I think the reason why I like, you know, actually put them into an array was because like he mentioned that, you know, he stores pictures of them and that kind of like, you know, naturally rendered itself to, you know, storing the cows. Yeah, like, you know, but like, I, yes, you're right. Like, yours is like objectively more efficient in this case. So. But I mean, yours is more flexible longer, so. <laughs> yeah. Anyone have questions about like the simplest approach? That stuff is fine. Does anyone have questions about like the basic way of how to do these? I just want to make sure I'm tracking. So when you were talking about you have a, you know, you sort of thing, you have a dictionary, are the keys just the days and then the keys are the cows actually, and the corresponding amount of milk. So, so, so you said after you sort these, Henry, to go back. After you sort these, these are irrelevant to us. Yeah, because okay. they're sorted. So the last time you said we can only go through it once, right? Remember that? Yeah. You can only get this part once. Okay. So how do you? I mean, yeah. So if you store it in a dictionary and you go over it again, that's fine. Okay, but you're not storing it in a dictionary, right? So sorry, you would have to add. You'd have to do like so a, a in, in the previous in yeah. the in the previous question, like there what existed a solution, right, where you could only go through it once, and that is objectively better, right, because you're kind of cutting down the constant factor by three. In this case, the only way you could get a sorted thing is if you store it in a temporary array, right, and then do it. Like there's no way you okay. can have like an online algorithm that does it, like as you get more, right? No, unless no. you make it more, unless you have like a Okay. No, I was more going to say, like, I guess you're sorting it, and so that means we have to say it somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah. Like that. So, in which case, uh, like, one of my interview questions when I got my job was similar. You have, like, a log file, um, but it was, it was a bunch of numbers. But the thing was, like, you could go over it once, uh, even though it was unsorted, by kind of doing a default value in your dictionary, right? So, I was going to say, like, if you come across a cow you don't know about, yeah. you could. Like say it was sorted, right? You wouldn't have to like know the cow's names ahead of time. But I mean that's an implementation. So. Yep. All right. A um, couple things to note about simulation problems. So explaining these simulation problems works out. Um, the whole point is that, like for example, if you look at this problem, it seems pretty obvious, you just need to find the switch and you can find the solution. But to a computer, it's a lot harder to actually do. Um, so thinking about things in terms of data structures and how you would go through it step by step, um, pseudocode, is really, really important. But what's even more important, and sometimes what tricks people up, is the implementation. These simulation problems at a higher level are supposed to be implementation problems, where the implementation of it is somewhat difficult to actually go through and like get through that that's what makes these problems challenging and honestly fun so if you are generally interested i would suggest that you go through all of these uh, we have provided links to these that has an auto submission so if you make a solution for these and you submit it to these websites it would tell you how it goes and it would tell you if you had a memory error if you had a time limit error and so on and so forth make sense Next class, we will actually go over some of the math concepts that goes over this. Um, and other announcements, for those that are participating in um, the Husky Hold'em, we have an engine, and it has been released. So if anyone wants to um, participate, you can just uh, download this on your computer. Uh, the only thing that you need to worry about realistically is this one file called player.py, uh, we've given you three to four functions. Um, that's all you really need to do to build your bot. 
Um, it's as simple as that. It's a, and just submit it to um, uh, our Poker Den website. Um, yeah, look forward to seeing all of your bots. Yeah, questions? What's the environment for them? Uh, we have a lot of EC2 instances running um, all at the same time. Is there a rule book? Yes. There's a wiki. Um, if you want, you can head to our website. Um, we have a wiki. It goes over the rules. It uh, also goes over the engine. Engine has some interesting implementation details if you want to look at them. Uh, it's on the comments of the actual thing. Um, it's also on the wiki. Like, if you go and you check out a lot of the comments on like engine.py kind of goes over like here's the interesting stuff that's actually happening. Um, other than that, does anyone have any other questions about this session, uh, ATC, anything going on, so on and so forth? Is it almost over? Yes. Yeah, I turned my calendar on. <laughs>